Hello, hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Olmos, and I'd like to talk about uh, sleep-related breathing disorders and what that actually means. So I think the first thing is to talk about exactly what is proper breathing. And uh, so I have a little uh, demonstration model here to show us um, what is proper breathing. Well, proper breathing is, is nasal breathing. So air should um, enter through the nasal valve. Um, be spun around through the turbinates. You have superior, middle, inferior turbinates. And so the air is moistened, filtered, and warmed uh, before it is brought into the airway. Okay? And so this is your immune system. Um, as air is being drawn through, it takes, uh, it's like a suction effect that draws um, uh, the gases out of the sinuses called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is very important because it's um, antimicrobial, so it kills bacteria, viruses, and fungus. And so every nasal breath is bringing this gas into our lungs and, and protecting us against things like COVID, which um, there's papers that are showing that nitric oxide is very effective in, in, uh, in protecting us from catching this virus. Um, so this now gets into your lungs and the gas now permeates out into your bloodstream and causes the vessels to dilate and this then lowers your blood pressure. So nasal breathing helps lower blood pressure. Now if the nose is blocked at any point then we have to open our mouth to breathe. This is abnormal. The nose is the organ for breathing, mouth is the organ for structure for eating. And so where these two come together is right here uh, in what we call the velopharynx or the soft palate area and so this is the most narrow part of the airway. And um, if the nose is obstructed and the mouth now has to open to breathe, then it causes all sorts of muscular issues and disturbances. And so there's a bit of, of uh, structure and a bit of neurology to the people that have breathing disorders. And what that means is, is that uh, people that have apnea, they breathe just fine in the daytime. I have apnea. I can breathe right now as I talk to you. It's, it's just that when I become unconscious is where the muscles in my airway then relax and collapse. And so therefore sometimes uh, position makes a difference. So in the supine or uh, laying on your back, as the jaw then falls back with gravity in the tongue, that then it can be obstructed right here uh, in the oropharynx. And so then there are situations where we have narrowing so that the air going through is now uh, narrowly obstructed, but not completely obstructed. So that would be situations like snoring, where you have vibration from narrow tissue. Now, snoring has been found to produce cardiovascular disease um, and, and uh, is, a, is a very big factor in producing what's called oxidative stress, which is the mechanism for causing inflammation and breakdown of our cardiovascular system. Um, so snoring is just not innocuous, it's just not funny or silly or a nuisance. It, it, is, it is actually uh, harmful to um, your whole body function. Um, then you get uh, another stage of, of uh, collapse where you have something where you have a narrowing, um, not complete obstruction, but you have so much resistance that trying to breathe wakes you up. And so that's called upper airway resistance syndrome, and that would be narrowing in, in this area here. Um, and, and then the next degree of, of uh, breathing disorder would be uh, uh, apnea. Now, if it's obstructive apnea, that's where the tongue and the jaw fall back and against the palate here, and, and the soft palate then, and all of these structures block the airway. And that's where no air comes through, and that's called apnea. Or there's so little air coming through that the oxygen in your blood drops about three percent and we call or three or four percent depending on which um, uh, evaluation system you use and that's called hypoxia so we add up the number of times you stop breathing or suffocate apneas and the number of times you, your blood oxygen level drops three or four percent from normal at, at, at sea level it should be about 99 percent so if you're dropping below 95 percent that's a, a big issue and every time you do we count those up if the combination of those is greater than five per hour, then you need treatment for this problem. And that's either positive pressure that forces air, like a CPAP device that forces air into your lungs, um, or oral appliances or combination therapies that are necessary in order to keep the airway open. 
I personally use an oral appliance to treat my apnea um, and have had some nasal surgery to correct the problems and obstructions there um, so that I can breathe. But all four points must be open to be able to breathe and sleep comfortably. Nasal valve, nasopharynx, uh, the uh, velopharynx, and the oropharynx. So all four of these points have to be open all night long for you to be able to sleep comfortably well and, and, and wake up with the energy uh, and um, the, your, your ideal uh, health and, and memory. Because these, these things worsen during um, different stages of sleep. The first four hours of sleep are, are your restful sleep, your body sleep, your non-REM um, uh, sleep. And this is where the deepest sleep, delta wave sleep, is where you produce growth hormone and heal yourself. But as sleep goes on, it becomes more REM, rapid eye movement. And that's where you're basically paralyzed um, as your mind is, is, is actually um, more activated. And this is where you consolidate your memory and your thoughts. However, because your body's paralyzed, then the muscles of your, of your airway, they become more lax. And so if you're waking up um, anywhere uh, you know, throughout the night, usually after four hours of sleep, um, you may have one of these um, sleep breathing conditions and it should be investigated, especially if you're not waking up rusted. So I always ask patients if, three questions. Can you get to sleep? If you have insomnia, primary insomnia, you can't get to sleep, 50% of that is, is um, usually related to pain, chronic pain conditions. The other parts are respiratory. In other words, your brain doesn't want you to go to sleep if it knows you're going to suffocate when you're asleep. So it's a, it's a protection for a lot of people. And then there's the people that can get to sleep, but then they wake up throughout the night. And that's what I was just describing about when in sleep that you wake up. And then there's the people who can stay asleep, they get to sleep, they can stay asleep, but when they wake up, they're fatigued. And those are usually nasally obstructed people that have that chronic daytime fatigue. So we can separate these and kind of figure out exactly what we need to do so you wake up feeling good. And that's really um, the key, is you want to be able to wake up rested, start your day, and start it on, on a good note. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Steve Mullins from the TMJ and Sleep Therapy Centers.